Good morning. Welcome to worship. And to those of you joining us online, welcome as well, wherever you may be, here in the city or anywhere in the world, maybe even Madagascar. <laughs> Pastor Koppel is on a trip, uh, I believe, to Nebraska. We'll be gone a couple of Sundays. For those of you unacquainted with me, I'm Hal Nielsen, a retired pastor and a member here at St. Paul for many years. Uh, you probably will hear in my voice the New Mexico malady. It's called allergies, and they have been wild this week. Next Sunday, we celebrate the Feast of Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit in power upon the church. Invite you to wear red uh, for the day. I'm wondering, are there any other announcements? I know the bulletin is full, but... Anything that needs to be lifted up? Let's go ahead then and sing together. God is here. You'll find it at the back of your bulletin. <clears throat>
Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the wellspring of grace, our Easter and our joy. Amen. Look, here is water. Immersed in the promises of baptism, let us give thanks for what God has done for us. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your voice thundered over the deep, and water became the essence of life. And the rains, verdant rivers, the ark carried your creation through the flood into a new day. As your people pass through the sea into freedom's slang, in a desert pool, the film official entered your boundless baptismal light. Look, here is water. At the river, your beloved son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By the baptism of Jesus' death and resurrection, you open the floodgates of your reconciling love, freeing us to live as Easter people. We rejoice with glad hearts, giving all honor and praise to you through the risen Christ, our source of living water in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Look, here is water. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of 
Let us pray. Gracious and glorious God, you have chosen us as your own, and by the powerful name of Christ, you protect us from evil. By your spirit, transform us and your beloved world that we may find our joy in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated.
The first reading is from the first chapter of Acts. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers. Together, the crowd numbered about 120 persons and said, Friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in the ministry. So one of the people who have accompanying us during the, that time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when Jesus was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also known as Justus, and Matthias. Then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. Word of God, word of life. We will sing Psalm 1 responsively. of the scornful. They are like trees planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season, with leaves that do not wither. Everything they do shall prosper. shall not stand upright when judgment comes, nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. The second reading is from 1 John, the fifth chapter. If we receive human testimony, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God, that God has testified to the Son. Those who believe in the Son of God have the testimony in their hearts. Those who do not believe in God have made God a liar by not believing in the testimony that God has given concerning the Son. And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in the Son of God. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Word of God, word of life. So I wonder if some young people would like to uh, gather up front with me here. Anybody who considers himself or herself young? We have anybody today? Okay, here comes Gabriel, Noah. Yeah, come on up, guy. Oh, good. So do you like to play sports? What's your favorite sport? Soccer. Soccer. Okay. Soccer. How about you? Hockey. You like to play hockey. Good. Ice hockey. So you're, you skate. I play a different type. 
you play a different type of hockey. Okay. All right. Um, are you good at sports? Yeah. Run fast. Okay. How many on your soccer team? How many, how many players do you have on your team? Like 14. 14? Are all 14 of you on the field at the same time? How many on the field? On this pitch? 11. 11, okay. Is it always 11? Or does somebody once in a while get carded and maybe has to leave? Never happens on your team? Okay. <laughs> Five people on my team. Five, okay. Well, there's, there's, there's supposed to be six, but then one of my teammates um, moved to another team. Okay, so you're supposed to be six, but you're only five. Um, you watch any basketball? No, no basketball. Huh? So no, you don't know how many basketball players there are on a team? On the field, I'm pretty sure it's five versus five. Okay, five. What happens if there are only four basketball players on the court at a time? They're going to be able to play together as well? Something missing, isn't there? How about in baseball? Do you know how many baseball players there are on the field at a time? Okay, so much for the American pastime. <laughs> well, if you were to... Go Turn on your TV and count. I think you'd find nine, nine at a time. Do you ever watch any football, American football, NFL, yeah. college sports? We watch um, the Super Bowl. You watch the Super Bowl? Oh, that counts. How many football players on a team at a time on the field? Uh, like 10? And it's actually 11. And what happens if they're only 10? They're short-handed, aren't they? You know, Jesus had a group of people around him during his time on earth. Do you remember how many? You ever hear about the 12 disciples? Well, after Easter, it turned out there were only 11. One of them dropped off under sad circumstances, and so there were only 11 but the early followers of Jesus thought, we need to complete the circle. It was kind of like this uh, circle here. Uh, you know, it didn't have a top to it. So they needed to find somebody. So they gathered after Easter in Jerusalem, and they picked a 12th person in order to complete the team. And that's the way it was at the start. But it didn't start that way because soon there were many, many others on the team. Truth be told, we are also on the team. And the team doesn't have a limit to the number of players because Jesus needs us all to follow his way to do what he wants us to do in the world. So it may have started with 12, but it's gotten a lot bigger and you're part of it. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for including us on your team. Amen. Thanks for coming up. May we stand as we sing in the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to John, the 17th chapter. Jesus, raising his eyes in prayer, said, I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. 
They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave me, I have given to them and they have received them and know that in truth I came from you and that they have believed that you sent me. I'm asking on their behalf, I'm not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your names that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost except the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world, so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Consecrate them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I consecrate myself so that they also may be consecrated in truth. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Several years ago, the leader of a continuing education event suggested that we should all keep a yes file. A yes file is where you keep encouraging notes and cards and messages that you occasionally receive. And when you're having a down day, said the leader, pull out the file and read some of them. Let them, the messages, lift your spirits. So back in the day before we regularly used email and texts and X and Facebook to convey appreciation to each other, I labeled a file folder and started tossing in occasional letters and messages. You could easily do the same thing, of course, with an email fo folder. Recently, I pulled out the folder and reread the things I'd saved, like the note of thanks from parents whose very premature twins I baptized with an eyedropper in a neonatal care unit, and the letter from a former confirmation student who appreciated the class. That was too good to throw away. In a couple of letters, uh, people poured out their hearts about the struggles they were going through, and, they expressed gratitude for the support of the faith community. In several of the notes, people said they were praying for me. That gave me pause. Praying for me? When we think about prayer, it's usually in the context of praying for someone else. Last Sunday in the St. Paul 101 class, I learned some things about the prayer group here that I wasn't aware of. There's a group, I guess 16 or now 17 of you, dedicated to praying for those for whom prayer has been asked. That's the list you see in the bulletin. It's updated every Wednesday. First names only. No details or circumstances are shared aside from those that are written on the blue card. It's really good to know that several of you take seriously lifting up the needs of others before God. Sometimes 
I question the seriousness of political leaders who are quick to say to victims of catastrophe or tragedy, you know, our thoughts and prayers are with you. Too often I think that's a throwaway line. But not here at St. Paul with our prayer chain. But back to the matter of being prayed for. How do you react when someone says, I will pray for you? I must confess my first reaction when I read that in the yes file was embarrassment. And I know where that came from. One of the cards in the file was from my mother. She said, again, that she was praying for me. That evoked memories from long ago. Among us, there probably is someone else who is the child of immigrant parents. My mother, whose birthday was last Thursday, left her whole family in Norway for the U.S. at the age of 19. She met my father, a Swedish immigrant in California. She was 34 when I was born. In my early years, I thought my parents were so uncool, so square, as we used to say, compared to my friend's parents who knew what was going on. When mom said, I'm praying for you, which she often said as she sat with her Bible in the morning, I, I felt embarrassed. I thought it must be the piety she brought with her over from Norway. I got over it. And I'm grateful now for all the prayers she uttered on my behalf. But what about you? What do you feel when someone tells you, you're in my prayers? You say thank you right away? Or do you pause? Do you gain a glimpse of your vulnerability? Does it hit you that you're really not as self-sufficient and independent as you'd like to believe? That struck me anew when we learned that a Canadian friend of ours was hit and injured in an auto accident last week. She was the backbone of the family. That changed in an instant. Prayers on our behalf tell us that we really are dependent people. Well, today's reading from John's Gospel has Jesus praying. Uh, several weeks ago, we celebrated Easter with fanfare. Many of the readings we have had in the aftermath of Easter, however, the ones from John, come from before Jesus' death and resurrection. It's a kind of throwback. The texts we've listened to in recent weeks are all set on what we have come to call Monday Thursday. Jesus is gathered around a table with the disciples in a room somewhere in Jerusalem. Jesus washes their feet. He commands them to love. He forecasts his betrayal. He promises the Holy Spirit. He declares he's the vine, there are the branches. He warns them that some tough times are ahead. But take courage, he says. I have conquered the world. All this takes place around a table in a room in Jerusalem. They have a meal, but there's no mention of Holy Communion. That's in the other Gospels. Jesus caps the whole evening, the whole discourse, by praying out loud to God. The disciples are sitting there, listening to him, overhearing his prayer, realizing they're the object of the prayer. How they react. Did they feel embarrassed, vulnerable, uneasy, grateful? We're not told. But this must be said. Jesus prayed for the 12 sitting around a table, but in fact that the story that made it into the New Testament means only one thing. Jesus prays for us too. 
Jesus, who has come from God, remembers us before God. This is a personal, intimate prayer for each of us. I can't begin to explain or understand rationally what this means using the Trinitarian language of Christian history. There's something deeper going on here. What does Jesus say in his prayer? We belong. They, he said, the followers, the disciples, were yours. You gave them to me. All mine are yours and yours are mine. We live and move in all kinds of transactional relationships. We exchange goods or services or benefits. You have a leaky pipe, the plumber fixes it, you pay his bill. You insure your car, you have a mishap, the insurance company pays to the extent of your coverage. A relationship with God can be transactional, you know. God, heal my illness and I promise to change the way I live. God, help me acquire wealth and I will give you at least 10%. The relationship that Jesus prays about is the opposite of transactional. Diana Butler Bass, a writer you may be familiar with, put it this way. The ancient biblical creation stories relate a tale of intimacy between God and the world, an intimacy that becomes broken, but nonetheless is the primary relationship between God and creation from the beginning. Jesus cares deeply, personally, intimately for us. That sounds throughout the prayer. A word that appears several times in the prayer is guard or protect. Holy Father, protect them in your name. And while I was with them, I protected them. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. Jesus is praying here for anyone who feels alone and that nobody cares. God, be present with them, is his prayer. The renowned black theologian Howard Thurman remarked, there are few things more devastating than to have it burned into you that you do not count. If Jesus prays for you, it means you count. You are protected from despair. The disciples quickly learned that Jesus' protection wouldn't spare them from suffering and trauma. They, they were sent into the world to continue the mission of Jesus. That road seldom was smooth. We've learned that too. Challenges to living faithfully arise every day. Everybody on that prayer list in your bulletin is facing a challenge of some kind. A church committed to the way of Jesus constantly has to discern where that way should take it, how well we know that here. But I take great heart in Jesus praying for his disciples, for us, for the church. I hope you do too. It's his yes to us. Amen.
Rejoicing that Jesus is risen and love has triumphed over fear, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need of good news. You sanctify us in your truth. Your word is truth. Send your church out into the world to spread your love and joy. Embolden all bishops, pastors, and deacons to be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray especially for our new bishop of the Rocky Mountain Synod, Megan Johnston Elabwoni, as she and her family plan their relocation from Jerusalem to Denver. Bless Bishop Gonia as he makes the transition out of the office of bishop. God of grace, hear our prayer. Your creation groans under the strain of pollution. Preserve melting glaciers and dwindling forests. Accompany all who live under the threat of wildfires, floods, earthquakes, and tornadoes. Bolster those who work for climate change and help us all to be good and faithful stewards of your creation. God of grace, hear our prayer. Your people seek wisdom, understanding, and peace. Guide all those who govern, inspiring them to work on behalf of the most vulnerable in our midst. Keep safe first responders, those serving in the military, and those whose duty it is to protect others. Fill the hearts of leaders with visions of peace as they lead in the midst of war and conflict. We pray especially for our president and the presidents of Israel and Ukraine and the leaders of Hamas. May the sanctity of human life weigh stronger than borders or other conflicts. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Your children need your loving care. Protect them from all harm. Comfort those in any affliction, especially those who suffer from illness, depression, addictions, infertility, loneliness, and any other condition that makes life difficult. We lift up those for whom, we prayer, for whom prayer is requested and those we name aloud or in our hearts. Support those who grieve and bring solace to those near death. God of grace, hear our prayer. Your spirit lives within us here. Inspire the work of this congregation and unite us as one. Bless all the mothers in our midst, as well as those who act in the role of mother. Console those for whom this day is difficult and gather us all under the care of your loving wings. God of grace, hear our prayer. Your love and the work of your kingdom extend beyond these walls. Bless our partners in ministry at Camino de Vida Congregation in the South Valley and in our companion synods in Madagascar. <clears throat> we joyfully anticipate the visit of the presidents of our companion synods this fall. Open our hearts, Lord, to needs and opportunities that stretch us toward more loving kindness. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Your saints dwell with you in light. Keep us ever thankful for those who have gone before us in faith. Inspire us by their witness. Let us feel their guiding presence as we live each day. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Into your hands, merciful God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abiding love through Jesus Christ our resurrected and living Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. May we share a sign of that peace. Not a handshake. No.
us pray. Risen one, you call us to believe and bear fruit. May the gifts that we offer here be signs of your abiding love. Form us to be your witnesses in the world through Jesus Christ, our true vine. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. We pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give, give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sin, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. For the kingdom, power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The risen Christ is made known to us in the breaking of the bread. Come and eat at God's table. You may be seated. I invite those of, at home to prepare their communion and those of you who may choose to commune in the pews. Following the Lamb of God, then, we will have two stations at the head of the aisle. Welcome. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy.
the body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. given for you. The body of Christ given for you.
Shepherding God, you have prepared a table before us and nourished us with your love. Send us forth from this banquet to proclaim your goodness and share the abundant mercy of Jesus, our Redeemer and friend. Amen. And as our visitation team brings communion to those unable to attend in person, we pray this prayer together. Gracious God, loving, loving all your family with a mother's tender care, as you sent the angel to feed Elijah with heavenly bread, assist those who set forth to share your word and sacrament with those who are sick, homebound or imprisoned, in your love and care, nourish and strengthen those who will receive this sacrament and give us all the comfort of your abiding presence through the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, Christ our, our Lord. Lord. Amen. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. The God of resurrection power the Christ of unending joy, and the spirit of Easter hope bless you now and always. Amen. Rejoice and be glad.